welcome. I'm Laura Mandel, Executive Director of the Jewish Arts Collaborative, and on behalf of J Arts and CJP, the creators of the Boston Community Creative Fellowship, I'm delighted to introduce you to one of our two 2022 Community Creative Fellows, Ira Klein. Welcome, Ira. Thank you so much, Laura. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Thrilled to hear from you. So before we get into the conversation, you should all know that Ira is an award-winning guitarist, composer, and producer who grew up in Jerusalem, but is currently Boston-based. He is inspired by his fascination with several folk music traditions, predominantly Ladino and American roots music, as well as his background in jazz and rock. Ira takes a melting pot musical approach to create his sound, and he's taught at Berklee College of Music, the Cambridge Music Consortium, the Club Passim School of Music, and the Concord Conservatory of Music. He graduated at summa cum laude with a Bachelor's of Music in 2020 from Berklee, and he's currently a master's program student at the Longy Conservatory of Bard College in Cambridge. So no, no credentials there, Ira. <laughs> He's, he's performed widely, including local performances at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, Harvard University's Carpenter Center for Visual Arts, Smith Center and Holden Chapel, Boston University Hillel, the Longfellow House Museum, and Mount Auburn Cemetery. So before we ask you some questions, um, let's look at a video clip so we can get a sense of who you are. Okay, so now that we've seen this video, beautifully done, um, we get a sense of who you are. So let me ask you, we are so excited to have you as a community creative fellow as part of this growing resume. Let's start at the beginning. Tell us a little bit about growing up in Israel and how your, you know, what your childhood was like and how this turned to music and how you came to be where you are now. Yeah, so thinking about it, and reflecting back on the way that I was growing up in Jerusalem, and especially in terms of my engagement with the arts, uh, I was kind of taking it for granted at the time, but now I can appreciate how tight knit the artistic scene in Jerusalem was. And growing up inside that, I was able to be exposed to so many different kinds of art, not just music, but within music, um, from Ethiopian music to Moroccan music, Lesmer music to sacred music from other religions like Christianity and Islam. Um, and that was just something that was around me all the time. Um, so I think I really benefited from that a lot. And that really informed the way that I'm thinking, uh, which has always been interdisciplinary, making connections between different genres of music and even types of art. Um, so that's something that I really appreciate about the way that I was growing up. And it took me many years to even realize that that's what was going on. I think that's so beautiful and interesting because so many of us are aware of the sort of multicultural diversity of Israel, but the way you just frame that really brings it to life. It also makes sense that you're as into this sort of diverse genre, genres of music that you're into. Um, and you, you, you and I have talked about the fact that your work in the U.S. has been heavily influenced by the folk music realm specifically. Tell us a little bit more about that and how that led to your current interest specifically with Ladino music. Yeah. So back in Jerusalem, I actually grew up playing jazz and singer-songwriter music. And I started developing this awareness of folk music traditions and my more active, more analytical interest in them, the history, the stories behind them. Um, but that that kind of got stopped when I moved to the U.S. Uh, because I didn't have the cultural context anymore. Um, in the U.S., I did meet some really amazing traditional folk musicians who play American folk music. And that started just by accident. I literally ran into uh, one of my mentors in the hall at Berkeley one day. He was just <laughs> around holding a book and I was like, hey, this guy looks interesting. 
uh, let's have a conversation. Um, and that led me to maybe three or four years of really intense study of American folk music. I traveled to North Carolina, West Virginia, studied with people there. It was very important for me to try to um, get closer to the source, all right, or this idea of the source. We have to study it from the people who really are immersed in those genres of music. Um, and after a while in that space, I started thinking back about home and missing some of those sounds from Jerusalem. And reconnecting to that, I found Ladino as a very interesting uh, genre of music that really combines East and West in a way that feels genuine to where I am right now here. Um, and playing this music for other people in the US, I found that they could relate to it. It was accessible. Mm -hmm. um, so there are those couple areas of interest that are merged there. And another element for me that's very interesting about Ladino is that it's a little bit of a dying tradition. Yeah. There aren't a lot of people that speak the language. Um, there aren't a lot of musicians who make their career centered around this genre. And so as a young person, it feels very meaningful to try to carry this forward and renew the tradition in a meaningful way. You are such a wonderful steward of our culture. So with that in mind, you've sort of already touched on this, but give us a little bit of a snapshot more of what you hope your music will achieve. What will it move? What will it make audiences think? So I think, you know, for me as an art consumer, um, which informs the way I want my art to be consumed and experienced by others as well, it has to move me on a visceral level first. Uh, so that's my first aspiration is just that it will be very emotionally um, haunting and strong. That's the first thing. Beyond that, I hope that it will make people reflect and ask questions about their life and perhaps also about history. I think for me, one of the interesting things about folk music in particular is that many folk songs are like recipes for a good life, how to live a righteous life, or they pose questions. They tell you a story that makes you think, you know, who did the right thing in this story? How did the characters behave? Uh, so, for example, there's a Latino song called Il Bastido, which is this, basically this woman reciting everything she's doing, you know, um, Monday, I'm folding the laundry. Tuesday, I'm thinking, when will I have time to uh, make you a beautiful vest? Right? So it's like a protest song from 600, 700 years ago. Uh, and to me, that's fascinating. It's amazing how in some ways that's so mundane and yet so important in understanding the history and culture of our world. Wow. So something that's so important to us at J Arts and CJP, and I know for you as a fellow, is that this fellowship is really about this balance between developing your own work personally and creating a communal process. So um, I love that we've gotten sort of the personal snapshot from you. Before we segue into the communal piece, um, let's watch another video clip that I think is going to really give a sense of what you were talking about with this beautiful and haunting work. So let's watch this piece next. Um, Ira, just beautiful. I am so excited for you to engage with communities, um, just based on these small snippets. So like I said, um, we've talked a little bit of the personal. Now I want to switch gears a little bit to the communal, um, because we know that the goal of CJP and J Arts in creating this community creative fellowship is to create capacity for community engagement through the arts, because we know that so many of you out there are eager to connect with Jewish culture and life through the arts, but it's sometimes hard to find that connection. So Ira, you and Rachel this season are our solutions to this, and we are hoping to develop 
excuse me, a sense of cultural, Jewish cultural literacy for our community around your work. So tell us a little bit, what, you know, obviously you've talked about Ladino in your music, but tell us what areas of Jewish literacy would you like to gain fluency in throughout this fellowship? And how do you think that might translate to the community? Yeah, so I think one thing that I'm thinking about a lot is this intersection of memory and art and also of history and memory at the same time. So different ways of viewing memory and history within our traditions and how I can work with my audiences um, during this fellowship to develop an awareness of this issue in oneself. Right? How do people think about their own personal story and about their uh, Jewishness within a society that has a non-Jewish majority. And that is something that communities around the world have uh, found very creative ways to deal with and very different ways to deal with throughout history. So I think that's a conversation that I want to become more um, limited in and I hope to expose my um, audiences to as well through this fellowship. It's beautiful. So tell us a little bit more on this specific front. What do you think we might expect if we're meeting with you during the course of this fellowship? So what would what would be most likely to happen if you're meeting me is first of all to learn more about my medium, which is music. Right. And I want to use the medium of music and the different traditional musics that are currently having a huge revival around the world and especially in Europe. You know, a hotbed of this revival right now uh, to create this conversation about variation, variation in Jewish culture. And that's something we can see very easily through prayers. Um, there is, for example, a website that I'm going to use uh, as part of my workshops um, that I believe is operated by the National Library of Israel, where you can go and listen to a prayer and you can listen to 50 versions of that prayer from around the world. You can just hit play and listen to how it sounds, you know, this is the Yemenite version, here's the Moroccan version, here's the German version, same words. Um, so I think that most of what I'm trying to do here is to show the variation and to think about that variation and what it can mean for us moving forward and what kind of variations we may envision as contemporary Jews moving forward forward within our communities and how do we use those variations to generate meaning and to generate community. That's beautiful. And so if you feel as inspired out there as I do, you can email Jamie Brody, Jamie B at jartsboston.org to schedule a time to have your community meet with Ira. Um, okay, so before we close up here, Ira, um, this has been the perfect little snapshot. Um, but here's a, a, one more question. Who or what most inspires your work? Yeah, um, so many things can inspire me. I don't think I'm very uh, difficult in that. Simply, I've seen a, um, just a little five minute report on Alec Katz, this um, painter who just had a, an exhibition open at the Guggenheim Museum. And he's 95 years old. He still paints seven days a week and he, you know, climbs on ladders to paint these huge canvases. So that for me was super, super uh, inspiring in terms of the artistic uh, aspect of life. And, you know, of course, my family, my partner, those people inspire me on a more daily um, and I think a more important level. Beautiful. Ira, I am so excited to come to a workshop with you. I hope everyone out there is as excited as I am. Um, on behalf of my colleagues and partners at CJP, Sophie Krenzman, the Director of Arts and Culture at CJP, thank you so, so much. I should also say a big thank you to your mentor for the program, Tova Speeder and Jonah Hassenfeld, who I know is going to be working with you on the Jewish learning front. So um, I'm really eager to see where this goes, Ira. We're so excited to meet with you. Thank you. Um, and like I said, if you're interested in joining ERA, um, please reach out to us at J Arts and we'll get it scheduled in the spring. Thank Thanks so much, ERA. I look forward to seeing you all in one of the workshops. <laughs>